jumping up to a mile and a quarter quickly, thinking, you know, that's a lot for him to do. And sure enough, we you know, we ran second to him. So, you know, it, this race, you really can't count anybody out, particularly a horse that's undefeated. No matter, you know, how little experience he has, you got to respect them. You've had horses run well in this race. Um, obviously, he's the best chance you've had because you haven't won the race yet, and he's the, the he's the one you have here. But what are some of the attributes that he brings that you think could make the difference to get you into the winner's circle for the Kentucky Derby? Well, we just we touched on, you know, this horse has um, he's got those three mile eight races, like you said. He's got plenty of experience. He's had some challenging trips. You know, he, he clearly looks like he wants the mile and a quarter. Um, like with Good Magic, you know, we have a champion two-year-old horse and and, um, and came into the race training great, coming off a of brilliant work, just like this horse worked. But there was always a little bit of question mark if that horse was going to get a mile and a quarter. I don't think anybody is questioning if this horse get a mile and a quarter. He might not win, but it's not going to be because he can't run a mile and a quarter. So um, that gives me a little extra confidence. You're watching the pace scenario with this race because... You haven't completely discounted bringing early voting in if there were certainly certain scratches. Yeah. What is the pace scenario at this point? You, think? you know, you I, even I, it. it looks fair. I mean, it, it you know, it, you're going to have a lot of horses, I think, going, you know, to get early positions. So that in itself causes at least the first quarter of the race, people are going to be, I think, sending out there to try to get their spot. Uh, right now, it looks like there's a, a fair amount of speed in there. So, um, you know, right now we're just planning on training them to the Preakness. So. I'm going to make a final decision by Sunday because that's when you have to ship here. Uh, right now, it, it looks, you know, almost certain the horse is going to train and just go to the Preakness. But I'm going to leave the door open just in case, um, you know, this race starts to, to have some defections, especially on the front end of the pacing area. And then I'll change my mind and get them over here. So on the one hand, you uh, really don't want any pace defections because of Zandon. On the other hand, it might set it up for... Uh, an yeah, for early and, and I'm not even saying Erlevo needs to be in the lead. In fact, I want to see him in a race where he has a target. He's finding himself a little lost in his races, I believe, late in the race. However, he's still a forwardly placed horse, even if I, there's some speed in front of him, which I actually would like uh, to tuck in or to have someone to follow. I'm I just not sure going a mile and a quarter and only his, you know, his third career start. If I want him to be around three-speed horses or four-speed horses, then I don't know if that's the right third career start for that horse. So that's really my issue uh, with the horse. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, so um, that's sort of the way I'm thinking. Fourth career start, excuse me. So he's only had three. So, um, you know, he, that horse, I have to manage his future too. It's easy to say, well, we have the points and he's got a good shot and his last number was good. And I get all that. And these derby horses are hard to come by. And for some people, it might be the only chance they're gonna have. I'd like to have the horse for the rest of his career, and I, I think throwing him in a mile and a quarter race where you know, he hasn't had the challenging trips that Zandon's had. This horse has been out on the lead and sort of clean when he comes home, not a bunch of mud on him. And you know, when you swing hard at the Derby and you miss, you have to deal with the aftermath when you're the trainer. And sometimes it's not pretty. You know, these horses need a lot of time, and they set them back mentally or physically, and and uh, that's just not the right. That's just not what we do over here. I can tell you that. Me or the owner of that horse, Seth Carmen, we, we try to manage it where we have a good shot to win the race, and also there's not a ton of downside if it doesn't work out. And with this horse right now, I think that it'd be a big risk to bring him over here and throw him in the, the, the deep, deep water here. His wood, I mean, it was a tough race. It was, I mean, were you impressed by it? I was. No, I'm, the, the horse has done everything right his first three career starts for me. He showed up, he's run well. Um, he, he got beat fair and square right by a good horse. I would like to see him with a target at some point too to see, I, I think that horse wanted to go on a little bit after that. Um, so hopefully he gets in a situation where there's there's someone to follow, even in the Preakness would be great. Um, of course, he's got enough speed where if he gets loose in a race and there's no speed, it's, it's great too. So he's a nice ha horse to have in the barn and he's done nothing wrong and I look forward to him having a great career. Said about swinging hard and missing at the derby. There's a lot of people that still want to swing hard. Now. Yeah. How do you kind of manage that with owners? Yeah, you know, you just, um, I guess it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends on the situation. Um, I can totally sympathize with, you know, people who think it's their only only shot. And look, we've had some huge upsets in the derby, so I'm not going to, you know, 
who am I to say or anyone to say you shouldn't shouldn't run. It just depends on the horse, the owner, the whole situation for me about managing the the, the long run of the horse. And uh, and it might be easier for me to say because I'll probably have you know many more derby entries in the future. Maybe the owner won't though. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to manage those situations. I'm always thinking down the road with my horses. I, I don't want to deal with, I've had horses come out of the derby and they've, some of them haven't really been the same. And I'm not criticizing the race, it's a tough race. I mean, you're talking about 20 horses, go to mile and a quarter very early in their life. So, you know, I, I, I'm learning about the race and I think you have to have a certain type of horse to not only go in with a chance, but exit with a future, right? So. You know, those kind of things I've, you know, I, I have to keep in mind, and I, it's, you know, part of my job is not only just training racehorses, but, but managing them and managing risk for owners. Chad, what would the Derby mean for you? You're one of the most successful Breeders' Cup trainers of all time. You've got a Preakness. Where does the Derby rank for you and your? It'd be right at the top. Yeah, for me and my team. I mean, they've worked so hard. You know, we've been doing this for about 15 years now, and. Uh, it, w it would mean a lot because it's you know it's the ultimate achievement for a for a, a barn for a team it mean a lot to me you know obviously i learned from from bobby frankel it's the one race that eluded him and i can tell you firsthand that very late in his career when i worked for him it was it was on his mind he was here with really live horses he had some bad luck in this race yeah. he really did he, he had a couple horses i thought could win when i worked for him and uh and he really, really wanted to win the race. I can tell you that. So, you know, to win that race for him too would be an honor. And I think a fitting tribute to him because he really taught me everything. Chad, when you were talking about past derbies, you know, and horses that, you know, maybe weren't the same. I mean, a horse like Norman Invasion, I remember you were really high on him. Yeah. He, the pace got hot. He took the lead at yeah. the top of the stretch. Yeah, I had some bad luck there myself. So. You know, that horse, I thought it was our first try at it, and I thought that we had a really good shot, and really just, he just moved too soon. I mean, um, pa you know, Palace Mills was running off with blinkers on the front end, and and uh, I remember Verrazano being outside of him, and then Verrazano beat us in the wood, and and, uh, and I think Javier just had on his mind that was the horse to beat, because he beat us in the wood, so he's just following him naturally, which, hey, it's, those are hard decisions to make in the middle of a race, so I'm not, not criticizing them, but evaluating the race rather than criticizing it, you know, I think the whole flow of the race sort of got screwed up and set it up for the horse that won ultimately. You know, down in the first turn of that race, we were about splitting the field between eighth and tenth, perfect on the fence. In hindsight, I wish we had just stayed there and been able to run with the eventual winner to see if we could have got there. But that's the derby. I mean, everyone has a story like that. If they've run enough horses in here, they, they didn't get a good trip. Uh, so that one sticks out to me. Uh, as one that maybe, just maybe, with a different trip we could have won, of course, with Good Magic to run in to justify. I think with Good Magic, he just was in the wrong year. Yeah, he got a beautiful ride. Uh, he squared up on that horse, turning for home. And in fairness to justify, I mean, that horse was flying down the backside. You have to think he wasn't gonna get a mile and a quarter. Um, and he rebroke again, and he did. So second best, just in the wrong year, I'd say, for that one. So those were two horses that were probably good enough to win some derbies. Right. Thank you. I've got a question. 